Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about all things Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, and some of you know me for another Beatles program that I host called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three regular co-hosts, beginning with the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hello, everyone. And also we have from Beatles Fan Magazine, Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. And also from Beatles Fan, we have Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, everyone. Hello, Ken. And also on the show, as we're, we got the giggles for this program, uh, we have a special guest with us, and that is Tom Fran Joan, who also writes for a Beatle fan. It sounds okay. like we have the Beatle, we have the Beatle fan brigade here on the show uh, this time out. And not only does Tom write for Beatle fan, but he also uh, helps out Joe Johnson for his radio program called Joe Johnson's Beatle Brunch, and he's also been a big part of the Fest for Beatle fans as well, helping Mark Lapidos out with the shows through the years. So uh, we welcome Tom to Things We Said Today. Hello, Tom. A pleasure to be with you guys. Um, it's This is an exciting show. I've listened to a couple of, of the installments, and uh, I love I love the idea of what you guys do. I'm excited to be on. And as a matter of fact, this is going to be like deja vu all over again, because when I started out in radio and I did my radio program in New Jersey on WDHA, Al Sussman and Tom Franjoen were regulars, and we used to do something at the end of each year, which was the year in review. We'd That's talk right. about the highlights of the year, and we'd also try and look forward to the following year. So okay. now I have Al and Tom back, and it's good to have you guys back for this and with two other editions. That's fantastic. That's right. Those were some great shows yeah. on DHA. I used to love doing those, and I think some of the big news back then, I mean, late 80s, early 90s, it was... Well, guess what? They they put out, you know, Red Rose Speedway on CD. That was kind of a big well, deal. As a matter of fact, didn't you mm. didn't you get a hold of a copy of the of the uh, the Russian album like oh, literally yeah. like the night before one the eighty I guess it was would have been the eighty seven show. Yeah, I remember we were going to do the year in review show. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a you know, your memory, Al, is uh, is sharper than most people give you credit for. <laughs> Um, we were going to do the show, and you know that had come in. I think the Friday or Saturday. You're right. Uh, brought it in. I know Ken opened up with a couple of couple of tracks, and then just slid one track in from that, and the phone started lighting up. People going, "Is this really it?" Mm -hmm. These are back in the days when you just couldn't, you know, get it online in ten seconds. You sure. know, something like that came out. So it was kind of kind of a neat. Uh, that was a first, I'm sure. Uh, in, in this part of the country to have on the air. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It was always an exciting thing to, to play something for the first time when it was a new release. And if you got it real early on, but before it was out in, in the stores, that was even more exciting. So, oh, yeah. That, you know, nothing more exciting for me than premiering new music on my show. But uh, certainly those were good times, and we thought we'd have you back with us because that's what the show is all about this time. We're going to do a year-in-review show for the year 2014. And since this is an hour-long show, it's going to be impossible to cover everything that happened this year. But I thought that this being the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in America, and my goodness, the Beatles were certainly in the news a lot for yeah. that reason, I thought, first of all, we'd start off the show specifically with uh, you, Al, and you, Tom, because I want to bring up the Fest for Beatles fans because it's it's actually we have an advantage having you two guys on the show in this particular case because you were at all three fests this year mm -hmm. the one in New York the one in Chicago and the first one in 14 years in Los Angeles so we're going to talk about the fest we're going to talk about the media's coverage of the 50th anniversary and whether or not we all were pleased with it and also then the releases uh on the Beatles as a group for the year and and what we thought about that as well. But let's just start with the Fest for Beatles fans. Alan, Tom, and, and Steve, who was at the L.A. one. Alan, I'm not sure if you were at any of the Fests. He was at the uh, the New York Fest. Okay, right, yeah. okay, at the New York Fest. Mm -hmm. So was um, the New York one. Yeah. Yes. Right, okay. So uh, I want to know if you, if you felt overall that the Fest really reflected a 50th anniversary Celebration. I know we had so many guests 
an, an overload of guests, more than we've ever had before, and it was wonderful. But was this really a, a, a celebration of the 50th anniversary, or was it more a glorified fest because we had so many incredible guests and so many events uh, and all three different fests in the country? Certainly the New York one was. That was... I've I, I I don't think I've ever experienced a week like like that week of the 50th anniversary. There was so much going on in New York, you know, not just the fest, but also there were all these individual concerts going on. The tribute concert at the at the Apollo Theater, right. um, the the marquee of the Ed Sullivan Theater was recreated to look the way it did that weekend. Uh, there were uh, there was a, a symposium at um, at Lincoln Center, which Alan was involved with, uh, and plus the fest was back literally in on the site of the first fest, the first Beatle Fest in 1974 at what is now the Grand Hyatt, which is one of the you know prestige hotels uh, in New York, and mm. so there was there was just I mean a palatable sense of excitement all through that week and particularly over that weekend and I know Tom and I particularly we were running back and forth like whirling dervishes I mean there were people <laughs> that I saw over the course of the weekend including I think Ken who I saw very briefly and then right. never saw again well that's the problem when you've got so many things going on exactly. at the same time there's, yeah. there's no way you can do everything that you want to do and it's it's kind of frustrating, and I would love to have a DVD of every single, every uh, panel discussion and every performance because I, I'm fascinated by all that stuff. But um, yeah, it was a, it was a really exciting weekend there. What did you think about Tom about the New York one, and well, and Alan, you too. Well, I thought you know, as a, you know to echo Al, I mean, the, the, you know, New York ultimately became one of the attractions, the, the city itself, because. You know, among all the things Al mentioned, there was also a little, you know, commemorative ceremony that the fest took a busload of people yes. out to Kennedy Airport, yeah. uh, where they put up a plaque to commemorate it and sang some songs. Um, I mean, so everything, you know, from literally from the arrival at, you know, at the precise hour they landed, what was kind of neat, you know, just as a, a nice big old asterisk to the whole thing was that the fest was held on the precise weekend that. Fifty years mm -hmm. later, it lined up on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, February seven, eight, and nine. So that right. that made it great. Um, you know, it kind of wrote itself at that point to some extent. The the conflict, frankly, that some people had beyond the there was too much to do. In, you know, in the hotel in three days, were also things like um, you know there was the event at the Sullivan Theater. You know, and the and the, the symposium that some people wanted to go to, and even. You know, as much as Mark made it a special thing at 8 o'clock sharp, he showed Ed Sullivan's intro and the curtain came up and Liverpool did the live set and everything. Obviously, everyone there would have wanted to watch the, the special, but hey, that's why they make DVR, right? Um, mm. So it was, there was all that to do. It was, it was, you know, I mean, to the, to the point where, uh, one of our, one of our good friends who's part of the fest, uh, fold as well, Susan Ryan, who does mm -hmm. the New York tours. There were so many people coming back to the fest and having it in New York. I mean, it, it made it a gimme, you know, for people that, that have never seen the Ed Sullivan Theater or been to the Dakota or, you know, any of the, the, the places in New York where they stayed or anything like that. It was just, it was, it was sensory overload for 72 hours. Mm -hmm. Wow. I would agree with there. And sometimes the people who are actually working the show are the ones that really don't observe enough. Yeah. Because they're so busy. Tell me. You know, we, I mean, we've had Mark on the show on things we said today, and, and he's so busy running around that he doesn't get to see everything, really, well, for which instance, is a shame. For yeah. instance, Mark and Tom did a presentation, uh, and this was for all three fests, at 11 o'clock on Friday night, they did a presentation on basically the creation of Beetlefest, and at which oh, they also showed the the 1974 Beetlefest film, Welcome to Pepperland. Mm. I never saw one minute of any of those three yeah. presentations because mm. I was involved upstairs with panel discussions. I was being held hostage by Bruce Spicer and Chuck Gunderson. 
Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's always, you know, we love going, obviously, just like everybody else does. Sure. And I know, um, and Al will, will accuse me of having probably too familiar a relationship with Excel and making schedules and databases <laughs> and stuff. But I, I look at the main rooms, whether it be the, you know, the, the symposium room, which was just jammed because of all the new books that are out now, anchored that uh, and did a, a yeoman's job on that. And then the ballroom, of course. And then the, the room with the activities such as, you know, the games and things that I that I host. So, you know, there are things I would call it have to do, things that I'm, that I'm assigned to, things I'm responsible for. And I look and I go, oh, man, I'm hosting the trivia, but that's right when Cousin Brucey is on it. Mm -hmm. For whoever is there, anyone who's listening, um, who took part in that live radio remote with Cousin Brucey. It was just fantastic. Yes. It really was great. Um, the, the folks at Sirius did a great job. And then we had, you know, another radio remote the following morning. I mean, that, that's how much excitement was going on, uh, over the course of those 72 hours. It was, it was really, really intense. Mm. Before we talk about the other fest, you want to tell us, Alan, about the symposium that you were a part of? Well, Lincoln Center put together a uh, an exhibition of Beatles memorabilia, things like that. I mean, I think they had some manuscripts and stage suits and guitars, things like that. And and also they put together several days worth of of things. But on on that Sunday, the ninth, um, there was a symposium that I was in, and Chuck Gunderson, Bruce Spicer, um, one of the guys from the Grammy Music which collaborated with the library at Lincoln Center, uh, technically it's called, I think, the Library of Performing Arts at Lincoln Center. And I think, you yeah, know, was it, was it, was it, was he actually, and he, mm -hmm. he had a separate day. He had, um, he had, uh, I think Sunday he, was his day, yeah. Um, I don't somehow remember him being in the group of us, I seem to oh, remember okay. him having his, he had, like, on Monday, I think he had a, a night all to himself. Oh, that's, yes, um, you're right. Which was good, you know, and, uh, um, you know, and it was, it was, it was fun. I mean, we were each given a, a, a certain uh, amount of time that we could speak, and, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. You know how the way these things are, you, uh, you, you prepare some stuff, and then you wing it, and you watch the clock winding down really quickly. But, yeah, you know, I mean, Chuck Anderson did a, a great presentation based on his book, uh, and, and um, Some Fun Tonight is the name of the book. It's actually a two-volume set. It's one of, the, mm. one of the great things that came out for the 50th mm -hmm. anniversary, I think. Uh, for, for anyone who doesn't know, it, it's, it, it covers the entire summer 1964 tour um, in great detail with all kinds of um, illustrations and documents and, and photos. It's, it's beautifully done, and he had a slideshow to or an, uh, you know, a, uh, a sort of computer, uh, I can't remember the name of the program. So he had a, a good presentation. Bruce as well, I mean, he also showed a lot of, uh, singles covers and album covers and he, and you know he goes through the whole thing about capital and VJ and and all of that uh mine was mostly about I want to hold your hand since my um ebook had just come out got that something and uh and that was mostly about I want to hold your hand so I played some of the um isolated tracks so that you could see how the thing was put together and, and uh you know it, I, I love hearing isolated tracks because it, it's, it, it gives you an interesting view of how a piece is made. And, um, and then I scampered really as quickly as I could over to the Grand Hyatt because I was on a panel with Al and uh, Bruce, I think, and uh, was on a, a couple of panels over the, the few days. And, you know, it was a great deal of fun. Um, but what, you know... What I like about Beatles Fest, in a way, I mean, apart from the panels, which are always good, and in this case, the performing guests were much better than usual. I mean, Donovan was there, and um, um, Ronnie Spector was there, and it, it's you know, it was just sort of fun popping in and out of that room and seeing people perform. Um, but also, I like the flea market. You know, I, I realize that at Beatles Fest. 
things are probably priced higher than they're going to be if you can find them in a flea market elsewhere. But mm-hmm. it's very handy to have all of those people in one place. Mm-hmm. You know, and a lot of them are dealers that you sort of, you know, know from, you know, magazines online ordering that you might do. And, and it, it's handy to, you know, put a face to the name and, and see their stock, uh, you know, in a, in a, a place like that, plus, you know, all the authors selling their books, I mean, you, and other people that you know from online, you, where you've, you've, there were a lot of people that I had arranged to meet in that room at that time at some point, and I'm not sure how we actually found each other, but we did. Um, so there's that, there's that social aspect of, of the fest as well that mm-hmm. I kind of enjoyed. And, uh, you know, I, I don't go, you, Al, I, I know, and maybe Tom, uh, you go to the fest all the time. I'm, I've only been a few times because um, I was usually working on weekends and it was uh, it was difficult to get to. Um, but it, it really was fun. And, uh, yeah, yeah, had a great time. Yeah. Um, I'm there just about every single year, the one in New Jersey. And for me, you know, the guests make it so worthwhile. And, you know, in particular, it, it meant a lot to me, even though they've been almost semi-regulars, people like Billy J. Kramer, Peter Asher, people who were there from the 60s who were such a big part of the whole Beatles story. You know, they're, they're so important in the, in the entire, in the history of, of the group. And to have those people there made it, very special, as well as groups like the Smithereens and to have people like, uh, you know, Jeff Slate there. You know, so many people connected with the Beatles. That's what makes it all worthwhile for me and to meet the people who listen to my show as well. Mm-hmm. But um, talk about the other two fests, if you can, briefly. And, Steve, you can chime in since you went to the one in, in L.A. And how did that compare to the one in New York? And did you feel there was as much of a 50th anniversary vibe to them? Tom, why don't you take that? Well, I thought L.A. was a terrific fest. It was, unfortunately, quite underattended. Mm. Um, but, you know, the, the, just the venue, you know, which had an outdoor element, you know, you couldn't be planning that in New York or Chicago this time of year. And I guess to Alan's point, you know, I love going to the, to the dealer's room, too. Uh, Friday nights, is, I always carve out time for that. Um, but in New York... It's kind of, I don't want to say same old, same old, a lot of the same dealers, a lot of the same stock. So seeing a lot of the, you know, the dealers from the West Coast who maybe wouldn't go 3,000 miles to do a show, but sure would set up right there, um, was real, real good. Guys like Rockaway Records and, uh, you know, they could bring basically their whole store over to the, over to the fest. That was real, real good. So that, uh, I, I didn't go home empty handed. Let's put it that way. Uh, and he had some great bands. He had this one band called Bambi Kino that does mm-hmm. kind of like a night at the cavern. It's all BBC stuff and Tony Sheridan stuff and, and they're real, real good. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, I thought it was laid out real well. It was a great facility. Um, I just, you know, I, I was a little bit disappointed at, uh, at the turnout. Yeah. Uh, ditto Chicago. I think Al, you know, we, you mm-hmm. know, we, we thought, uh, Chicago was a little bit light. Especially considering the fiftieth. Yeah, and considering the fact that New, that the New York show drew about oh. eight thousand people. Yeah. Uh, we probably got half that much, if that, if that uh, in yeah, uh, Chicago. That's probably is, right. You know, and, but you know, New York had so much what I'm going to call free publicity or yes. built-in buzz, whatever you want to call it. I mean, again. It was where it happened, and for what it's worth, yeah. when it happened. Yeah. Uh, it was. It just. It you know that thing was just you know an alignment of the planets. Oh. But um, the Chicago Fest was was a good one. A little bit of a different layout than he's had in years past. But Ken, you know, to your point, did it really feel like a 50th um, anniversary celebration? I think yes and no. Where mm-hmm. where it did feel like a 50, it felt like an anniversary or a celebration of 50 years of doing this. I think we all kind of looked around and said, wow, we've been coming here for 40 years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and a little quick math there, I started, that started getting a little scary about uh, how yeah. many years we've been doing this. But as opposed to a, you know, a, a precise anniversary celebration, well, in New York, uh, it obviously had more of the feel, again, because of the, the venue, but also because of having guys like Cousin Brucie and Ronnie Spector. 
and even though it wasn't part of the weekend proper, um, you know, guys like Asher showing up, people from the 60s and Billy J. Kramer, you know, that, that added so much to it. I mean, you know, Al and I meet with Mark a lot, you know, whether it be for lunch or just to, to catch up on things. And, you know, we start going through the, boy, who would make a great guest list? Mm-hmm. And when you start thinking about the people from that weekend, the ones who would, you know, really put a special stamp on it, well, who's left? One of them is in jail, okay, Phil Spector, mm-hmm. um, who came <laughs> over with them. Certainly, you know, Sullivan's long gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, Murray McKay is long gone. I mean, how many of them are left? But there were a few that, you know, boy, I have no complaints about that weekend. But, boy, if Cynthia could have come, that would have been great. Yeah. Um, mm. you know, but, but Patty uh, did. Yeah, Patty should. Yeah. Uh, which right. is kind of neat. Um, <laughs> you know, so there, there's, always, there's always, you know, looking at what else could have been. But for what was there, boy, uh, New York was tough to beat. Chicago yeah. was was you know a you know I think kind of your uh, your garden variety Chicago fest. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and but L A I, I thought was was a terrific show. Yeah. And I, I was just real real disappointed at the attendance and and even part of it. Um, you know, I know like Friday night especially you know tra- I mean we think traffic out here guys. What Garden State Parkway to the shore Long Island this is nothing compared to what they do out yeah, there. Yeah, really. This is amateur night. Um, yeah, I thought the LA Fest was great. Um, it, you know, it, we had a blast. Uh, it was nice doing that all over again after not having done it for 14 years um, and in the same place. It, it was just it, it was so much fun. Uh, I didn't get to do everything I wanted to do. I was busy walking around doing interviews and stuff. Uh, so, I mean, I was, you know, I wasn't just there as a spectator, but I thought it was a great show. Um, the one thing that I had a slight problem with was the fact that the dealer room was kind of quiet, and I think that was partially because the Fest dealers, the Fest, the Fest's own store was separated from everybody else's, and I think that it was not a good idea. Yeah, that's new. But the show itself was just fantastic. I mean, there were so many great people. There was, you know, we spent some time with Rob Shanahan. We we talked to Nancy Lee Andrews. I went. I mean, it was just it was just really really a lot of fun. And um, I hope he. I hope the rumor that he's not going to do it again is not true. Oh, another thing that was great there was Chris Carter's live remote. Um, that was that was just a whole lot of fun. Well, before we move on here in, in this conversation, any theories amongst you guys as to why the turnout wasn't what was expected? You think there was a, a fatigue factor maybe in the 50th anniversary? You know, because you would think 14 years it's been since L.A., you would have thought that would have been the greatest turnout. Well, I, so, I'll tell you this. I don't, you know, get involved in the business side with Mark, but I can tell you this. I went to Amoeba that morning, and, I mean, not only is it the biggest store in town, but let's face it, Paul recorded a live album there. Right, it's, right. It's got a Beatle footprint, right? Yep. Um, went there, and, you know, they have these big, uh, the underground garage with big um, banners and posters about the vinyl box set, which was brand new at the time, and Beatles stuff all over the store, and a huge selection of Beatles stuff. And when I checked out, and the guy, you know, um, you know, said, "Oh, you from the area? Oh, just visiting?" Or you know, somehow I get in a conversation with a guy at the at the counter and tell him I'm in town for the the Beatle Fest. He asked what that was. Now this is at, mm. at the biggest music store in town, mm. and you know, I didn't realize it till that minute. But I looked around Amoeba and saw nothing. No, no cards, no posters, no banners, no no flyers, no Slim Jims, no nothing. And I said, "Hmm." Th- this seems like a place you might you might have done that, you know whether Mark took out whatever his his plan was, whether it's radio advertising or in the local paper or wherever it was. Well, there was a billboard. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I think Amoeba might have been a missed opportunity, but you know that's mm-hmm. that's uh, you know Monday morning quarterbacking at this point. Hmm. All right, so uh, let's just say uh, a big thank you to Mark Lapidos for doing this for 40 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's such a tremendous accomplishment to itself. And uh, also, I was a part of the the the, um, the concerts in New York City that Charles Rosene organized, and right. they were wonderful. And the good thing about that, even though I wasn't crazy about the fact that it was running the same time as the fest, 
is that they really was it was the exact opposite of what the fest was. It was a celebration of the Beatles. It was a lot of artists who really either had no connection to them mm -hmm. at all or very little connection, but they showed their respect by playing their music. And so, you know, it's great to hear someone like Tommy James, <laughs> you know, do a Beatles song. Or even, you know, in one of the shows, the lead singer of The Cookies was there. Wow. So there's that slight Beatle connection. But I like that kind of thing. I just wish it wasn't so close to the fest. Mm. But uh, nice to have all that going on in New York at the same time. How about the media coverage overall for this past year? i, I got to be honest with you guys. I thought that what, the way this whole year played out was exactly the way I thought it would be, with all the focus being in February mm -hmm. and really dying down after that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's nice, it's nice that A Hard Day's Night came out on DVD in, in July, I think it was, for the anniversary. Mm -hmm. But there was very little after February. I so, can tell you that firsthand because in trying to promote Changing Times, I ran up against a brick wall as far as getting any kind of media penetration or media interest after March 1st because basically the media pretty much decided that after March 1st, it was basic. not only was it yesterday's news, but it was uh, yesterday's news 50 years ago. So, mm. uh, and I think it was the same way with the, uh, with the Beatle anniversary, because, uh, you know, once you got past that weekend, uh, they basically, uh, and then the, you know, the Grammy Awards, uh, the, um, the, the, the Grammy salute, um, once you got past there, the media pretty much uh, said, uh, well, let's see, what's, what's Taylor Swift doing now? Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I don't think that's that surprising, though, you know, no. because, I mean, newspapers really are supposed to be covering news, and they'll stop and take a look at, at something that happened 50 years ago and mm -hmm. celebrate it, perhaps, but, but they're not going to sort of have a year of, of nostalgia, so nothing was done about the summer tour and, uh, or, or any of that kind of stuff that would have helped if the Beatles and Apple had actually put yes. out some releases yeah. um, that could have gotten some coverage. Um, but from what I hear, uh, when Jeff Jones, who runs Apple now, you know, Jeff, for those who don't know the way it's set up, Jeff Jones runs the company in the way that Neil Aspinall used to, but the company is, in effect, the estates and the surviving Beatles. So... Everything has to be approved by all of them. And basically, when, from what I hear is that when Jeff Jones proposed doing some 50th anniversary projects, um, things that would have made a great deal of sense commercially, what he ran up against was Paul and Ringo not wanting anything to do with the 50th anniversary because they didn't want to think of it being that long ago and, 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 and what the implications for their ages uh, would be uh, sort of as if by not acknowledging it, the rest of the world wouldn't know that it was the 50th yeah. anniversary. It, it didn't make a lot of sense, but um, well, you know, you they, know. they did come out and you know they did take part in something that was called you know the night that changed America 50 years ago. And that's that true, but, but they did say, they did say, I think Paul said in one of the interviews, you know, we really were sort of wondering if we should do this, and they did get talked into it, but uh, right. by but then... Apple, Apple also did a box set, right? So, I mean, you know, right. that, that did come out uh, just in time for the 50th, of course. That's um, true. You know, so there, there was something, uh, that, and let's face it, that is a company that has been notorious and outspoken <laughs> about not doing it because it's an anniversary. Mm -hmm. But right. even this one was one that they couldn't they couldn't ignore. So they did the American albums, um, about which we may or may not uh, want to comment. <laughs> um, but you know what they could have done is brought out uh, in the summer a revamped version of the Station, Shay, not Shay, uh, sorry, Hollywood, Hollywood Bowl. Bowl concert and uh, maybe some of the other concerts from that tour because we have quite a number of soundboard recordings from that tour. Mm -hmm. And that would have put them back in the focus again and the 50th anniversary back in the focus again. And it would have been a release that everybody would have, I think, been pretty happy with. So they lost an opportunity there. It's a pity. Well, maybe that's the, the 65 play, the 50. I, I have no idea whether the acknowledgement and, you know, having to, uh, to cater to the anniversary uh, market 
was a one-time thing because it was so big, because it was, you know, the invasion, whether they use that as a, a testing ground to say, well, how did that go over, and does it warrant us thinking about whatever's coming up next year, help, Shea Stadium, whatever might be uh, turning 50? Mm -hmm. Well, all the implications were that I, I think that the Beatles' live project would be coming out next year, and, and this kind of makes sense to me because if, if uh, Paul and Ringo don't want to hear a 50th anniversary over and over again, this is a, w a way of, of bypassing that and making it a documentary of all the Beatles' live performances instead of just the 50th anniversary of the Hollywood Bowl, mm -hmm. etc. So that I think they'd probably go more in that direction, although I think most fans would would prefer complete concerts. Sure. You know, and they so. do have and they do have the Shea Stadium thing sitting on the shelf and they had that ready to release before the anthology and still mm -hmm. haven't done it. Mm -hmm. So and that would be fiftieth anniversary for next year. So if they wanted to avoid the whole fiftieth anniversary thing, they should have put it out when they originally finished it. Yes. <laughs> true. So do we want to talk about the Capitol box set? Your thoughts on that? Let's let's do uh, each of you here, one at a time. Alan, how about you first? Okay, sure. Because I know Alan and I don't really see eye to eye on this. Right. Um, so we can we can have some back and forth here. Um, here's my feeling about it. I mean, I've, I've actually two diametrically opposed feelings about it. I'll do the positive one first. It's beautifully packaged, mm -hmm. and when you play them, it really is a joy to listen to, and it is those sequences that you remember uh, from growing up, you know, for those of us who grew up in America, which I guess probably most of the listeners of the show probably, um, you know, that, that was what we grew up with in those sequences, and it's, it's fine, and the sound is good, and all that stuff. What I think doesn't work about them as releases that are supposed to be historical is that they also don't sound like the American issues did. Because although we all have spent a lot of time criticizing Capitol for larding those releases over with reverb, the fact is that was the sound we heard. And when they came out in 2004 and 2006, the first two installments of Capitol uh, mixes, um, I actually, you know, not having heard them probably for decades, um, I actually kind of enjoyed hearing them that way again, as larded over with echo as they were, and uh, with fake stereo, all that stuff. I, I found it very fascinating, because the fake stereo was a little more complicated than I remember. I seem to have, I remembered it from childhood as being just the bass on one channel, and you know, or EQ'd for bass on one channel and EQ'd for treble on the other, but I hadn't sort of remembered that sort of microsecond delay that they put in to sort of make the ear feel that there were different things coming out of each speaker. And um, hearing them again that way, I kind of liked them. And so what I would have wanted for the 50, for the, the USA album set would have been possibly upgrades, uh, you know, upgraded transfers of those same releases um, and the rest of the set because they stopped after two installments and there were still some things missing. Um, I would have liked either just a third installment that had the missing stuff or a new set remastered but using the capital mixes as we heard them in the 60s because I felt also that to use the 2009 mixes, I mean, I can put together an iTunes playlist right here using the 2009 mixes myself with the exception of a handful of unique American mixes. So basically what I was buying was maybe one short disc of mixes that were not otherwise available uh, in you know current quality and a really nice booklet and a really nice box, which to me didn't totally justify the price. But, you know, as, as I said, you know, these were my objections and they were fairly theoretical when I put the things on and played it. I, I, I really did enjoy them. So, Al? Hmm. <laughs> well, okay, this is the, the, the main difference that Alan and I have is that uh, this is uh, coming from somebody who spent 30 years in, in the record business, so I kind of think in those in those terms. And the main difference between 
uh, the situation in 2004 and 2006 when the first two boxes came out, and this one, is that in the case of this box, the U.S. Albums box that came out in January, all of, except for the Beatles story, all of the individual albums are available, are to this moment available separately which was not the case with the 2004 and 2006 sets. Not only that, but, so so in other words, if somebody goes into a store that has a, you know, a stock of Beatles CDs, they will see not only the regular UK albums, but also the American ones separately. Not only that, but every track on every album is available separately via, as a digital download via iTunes and Amazon and the other digital platforms. With, and that's the reason why Jeff Jones, according to uh, Jeff Slate, uh, made the call that on a rather small number of tracks that were mainly from 64, that... Uh, specifically from the Beatles' second album. I think that's probably the one album that in which the substitutions were most prevalent, where he decided that the sound on those heavily uh, reverbed, uh, echoey, sort of uh, duophonic tracks, that the sound on them was just not up to the standards of the 21st century. And so he made the call that that small number of tracks would be replaced with the 2009 uh, remasters. And I, you know, so I don't really have a problem with that only because of the fact that if somebody who's just a casual fan, especially a young fan, goes to iTunes and sees Rollover Beethoven, and sees the different albums that that's represented from. If they are not familiar with the dual phonic or heavily reverbed versions, they may click on one to hear a 30-second sample and think, what is this? You know, this doesn't sound good. You know, so basically, Jeff Jones was opting for the, the best sound available to make it the most viable marketable package not only as a as a uh, as a box set but also the individual albums and the individual tracks and it's actually and we're really talking about a, a fairly small number of tracks uh, plus the fact that you know if you're that wedded to the original, you know, the original uh, mixes from 64 and 65, you've got them already on those 2004 and 2006 sets. So that's... At print. Right, but presumably, but presumably you bought them in 2004 and 2006 <laughs> if, you're, if you're a real kind of hardcore fan that's really wedded to those versions. Mm-hmm. That's true. Okay. I think the Capital the U.S. Albums box set was more like a decoration than anything else. Um, I mean, it looks great, but the sound isn't authentic, and I think that's, you know, the major problem with it. I mean, it's it's great to have sitting on your shelf, but if you really want the authentic sound of the Capital Albums, you know, you get the earlier sets, and unfortunately they're taking them out of print, which I think is crazy. Um, they basically... The, the remastered song sound, I guess is the better term, is their standard for, for Beatles songs now, and they're not going to accept anything else, which historically, for those of us that care about history, is not the way it happened. Yeah, and my general feeling has been that even if you thought that those mixes were the crappiest mixes ever, that's mm-hmm. the way they were. And if Jeff Jones is, is saying that this is for the casual fan, well, the casual fan doesn't care about the Beatles' second album. That's really catering to the people who grew up on it. I so I also see your point of view that, yeah, those people probably bought those, those sets in 2004 and 2006. So I see your point in that, Al. But, you know, this is like revising history. Well, you know, it really is. 
that's the point, you know, Ken, if I can, you know, throw my two cents mm -hmm. in this, is where these albums, and Al makes a great point, that they're available separately. So you go to your local Barnes & Noble, and there's, I'm going to call it the proper version, the UK version of Rubber Soul, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you find the US one, the identical cover, okay? identical cover, and you're looking at a, at a wildly different track list. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it doesn't do anything really to, uh, to cement, you know, the legacy of, what, of how the band wanted these records. The, the obvious, you know, glaring example is Revolve, right? It's not a wildly different set of songs. It's just a shorter one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, and then you say, wow, this must have been the, someone's going to pick that up and go, this must have been the period, you know, when John was really disinterested. There's more George Harrison lead vocals on this record than there are John Lennon ones. Mm -hmm. These, these are, you know, yes, I know it's how Americans first heard them. Yes, it's how I first heard them. Um, it doesn't mean that it's, that it's good. Uh, the mm -hmm. way I first saw a Magical Mystery Tour was in black and white and on about a hundred generation uh, mm -hmm. film transfer. That's how I remember it, but I'll sure take the DVD over that any day of the week. Um, I think by presenting it in in the right quality, you're, you're, we're really down to you know semantics here, but it's the configurations. And to Alan's point, you know these are you know these are albums we could have compiled as playlists, etc with the exception of a handful, you know, of things, you know, like where where the American uh, record company decided, you know what, I'll cry instead is too short. You know, mm -hmm. let, let's throw another 30 seconds in it, but you know what, the title might be too long, so let's shorten that to I cry instead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> you know, just because it's how it was done then doesn't mean it's how it should be done now. Yeah. Um, I, You know, going back to, you know, my teen years, when I first found out that you could get import records, um, I, I was a big, you know, convert to the British records, you know, if only for the the sound quality of them uh, for for decades. And these are the configurations. And being the accountant that I am, um, you know, the standardization of the catalog in '87 is something I think they should have stuck to. Yeah, I know fans are going to go, yeah, but I loved Beatles' second album. And by the way, you know how many bad songs are on the Beatles' second album? None. Okay? Uh, it's, it's how I heard, first heard that configuration of songs. It's where I always found you really got a hold on me and, you know, and it won't be long, or not it won't be long, or, um, you know, all over Beethoven or whatever was on there. But that doesn't mean that's how it should be redone. It just doesn't. Well, it isn't how it should be redone, but this is the market for this is basically a nostalgia market in a way. It, well, it's one, it's two things. It's either a nostalgia market. It's for people who want to put on the record they heard as a kid, even though they now know that the record is is different, or it's people who want to know what people heard at that time. And for both of those uses. The original sound, I think, is important. And also just weird things like, I mean, I mean, not everybody is going to have an experience like this, but once when Mark Lewison was working on one of his books, he was at my house and he had never heard Beatles 65 and he didn't quite, he knew that there was something about, uh, Echo lorded over some of the tracks, but really didn't understand the extent of it. And I put on, the vinyl of Beatles 65 and She's a Woman and he could not believe his ears. <laughs> he was yeah. like, what did they do to that record? <laughs> you know? And, and I mean, I, I, just, I just think, okay, you know, as Al says, the, it, it is available on CD if you can find the 2004 or 2006 set, but you should be able to if you want for either historical listening purposes or pure nostalgia to be able to go take out a disc and play the, the record as it was. I well, mean, I think mostly you'd want yeah. to hear Beatles for Sale, it's true, but, um, you know. Well, I, I, lo I love hearing all these different points of view here, and I can certainly sympathize with all of them, because, uh, you know, I grew up on the American albums first, but to be honest, once the CDs came out in 1987, that's how I listened to the Beatles music. Mm -hmm. I heard it the way that they wanted it to go out. But at the same time, this is the way people grew up on it in the 60s in America, and I don't think that should be discounted. I mean, I, I, I heard what you said, Tom, but, you know, there is historical value in the way that people grew up hearing this music. And even if, like I said, they're, they're horrible mixes, 
to our ears now, and for some people, they may not be. It should still be available. I'm not saying it should be the only version out there. I'm just saying that you should have all the versions out there available all the time. Well, I think if they made it available in, in just such a way without confusing things, as Al brings up, like on mm -hmm. iTunes or, um, or uh, you know, there you are at uh, wherever you buy a CD these days at Best Buy yeah. or something, and there's two versions of Revolver. Hopefully there's two versions of Revolver. I'd, I'd mm -hmm. like somebody to look and say, hmm, you know what, I'm thinking the 14-track one will do it. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. You know, but, you know, the the poor guy that says, all right, you know, Revolver's getting a lot of attention. Heck, there are books written about it at this point, plug for Rob Rodriguez. The British magazines now rate it, you know, as the best Beatles album of all time. And people are going to go find that thing in a store somewhere and get the wrong one and say, oh, no, you know, I don't think it's so good. I mean, heck, John doesn't even get as much airtime as George. What's that about? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's uh, that's just my take on it. The, the problem is is that, and this is I think where you know Jeff Jones's point is that the majority of people now they don't buy CDs and they don't buy you know their they don't buy recordings in stores anymore. The majority of people now, you know, they buy the recordings as downloads from iTunes or Amazon or or whatever. And so, so they need to be chastised. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I hardly ever do that, but I'm I'm not the age of the average record buyer now. But yeah, you but know the, that by the very that nature the, of, now, of this box set negates itself, though, then by the fact that they put them on CD. You know? Mm -hmm. you know well, that, that whole stance is just, you know, kind of neutralized by that. You know, the fact is that they are on CD, and, you know, that's if they put it on CD, presumably it was to be consumed. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, to take a to, to take a futuristic jump ahead, um, when they around the time they were putting out the 2004 and six sets and working on the 2009 remasters, I had lunch with Bruce Spicer, and he had a really good idea. He thought that what they should be doing is putting everything out on Blu-ray, which has, as you know, enormous mm -hmm. capacity. And that would let you put the British mono, British stereo, American mono, American stereo, and a bunch uh. of singles and outtakes all on one disc. And that would solve the problem for everybody. You could just have each, each track labeled exactly which mix it is, where it was from. And, um, and, and we wouldn't have to debate whether which, whether one is right or wrong because you'd have it all. In Absolutely. Well, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, we did the show on, uh, the, with the Beatles period and including Meet the Beatles and the Beatles second album and the singles and all. Mm -hmm. You could do exactly that. You could put all three of those albums plus the singles of that period on one disc. Mm -hmm. So, so Bruce's, Bruce's idea is a good one. It's yeah. probably not going to happen, but, uh, <laughs> but it's so, you know, at, at some point, you know, while that's all good as the deluxe is for sure, you know, the band's, you know, legacy, the way they wanted it, the output, mm -hmm. that still has to stand kind of as the definitive word. I think we could all agree on that. It's I a matter so, yeah. of how all this gets presented. So when you take even something like the anthology, which was done, I can't believe, nearly 20 years ago already. Mm -hmm. There was no question when you picked that thing up and you looked at the back and said, oh, this, this is the album Can't Find Me Love is on. Uh, there was no question about it that the anthology was packaged, marketed, and stood as separate to the main body of work. I have no mm -hmm. problem with that. You could, you could bring on as much of that as you want. Um, you know, put it in a box somewhere and call it, you know, the... You know, the unsurpassed Beatles for sale session, you know, <laughs> slice and dice, whatever you call it, whatever you want. But at the end of the day, Beatles for sale has got to stand on, on its own. All 32 minutes of it or whatever it was, mm. you know. All right, so we're just going to cover a few more topics. And, and the way things are shaping up, we can only cover the group right now in this show. Although, if Tom wants to come back and we'll do a solo show, He's more no, I hate talking about solo Beatle records. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's the last time Tom will be on the show here. Yeah. Right <laughs> anyway, so why don't we just uh, each of us talk about, well, the mono vinyl set. Well, 
Alan, I know you want to you want to cover that one. Yeah, I really really enjoyed that set. Um, it uh, when it arrived, I mean, it's this huge block of vinyl. Um, it's beautifully packaged again, like the uh, like the U.S. CDs were. Um, the box is very nicely done. It comes with a book that is beautifully illustrated, has uh, nice essays by Ken How- uh, Ken Howlett. Um, and each of the albums is made to replicate the original packaging. So unlike in America where a sleeve is a smooth thing all around front to back, the British would kind of paste down the corners of, of, of the front on the back cover. Um, and that was, it was kind of nice seeing them done as they were done in the early 60s um, or in mid 60s. Um, the labels were precisely correct, with the exception of little bits of copyright information, which had to be different. And, and in a certain way, it's good that they were different, because these were so nicely done, you wouldn't want someone passing them off as actual originals, because they're obviously 2014 issues. Um, of course, a savvy uh, buyer would know that in 1963, 64, they didn't come out on 180-gram vinyl. But, you know, and that was another nice thing. I mean, these records are very hefty, and I didn't have a single warped copy. I didn't have a single skip or click or pop. Um, It was just a joy to listen to. And what I found was, you know, I, I, I can't say that it was absolutely revelatory that I was hearing things that I never heard before. I mean, I've listened to these things all my life, and they sounded the way they sound, but... They sounded a bit better in most cases than the original mono vinyl uh, pressings did. They have a bit more bass. They just sounded a bit smoother. Um, I think the disc cutting technology is a a little better now than it was back then. Um, And in this case, I think they were thinking really of the records as sort of audiophile productions, whereas in the 60s they were thinking of of them as just products that they were putting out there. So I think they were done a bit more carefully. There were a couple that um, that were not precisely off the master tapes because the, uh, the splices between songs were coming undone and getting glue all over the tape heads, and to cut aside a vinyl, it has to be continuous. So in those cases, they disassembled it, made a copy, and then made a, 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 a copy of each side to cut. But that was only Please Please Me, and I think it may have happened with Magical Mystery Tour, too. The other thing I really enjoyed about the set, uh, apart from just looking at how beautifully done it was and listening to the music in the mono mixes, which which is always fun, was the whole retro aspect of it. I mean, sitting back, listening to a Beatles record in mono, the way... You know, many, I would say most people originally heard them having to get up every 15 minutes to change the side. I mean, you don't really have that now. And while when CD first came out, we felt liberated from that, there was something I I found really charming about that being the way we're listening to this stuff. So I think it was just it was just beautifully done in every way. I, I'm hoping that those records will be fairly durable and that they will continue to play click-free for some time. Um, so I, I just found them really a treat. All right, great. At some point, we're going to be doing the, the stereo versus mono show. Actually, shows, I think, because it makes so, it's, it's great debate to have amongst people like us. Let's talk about the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We have Brian Epstein getting in, and also it was just announced a week ago, and we're recording this on uh, December 22nd, that Ringo is getting in uh, for musical excellence. And why don't we um, why don't we talk about Brian first? Who wants to who wants to cover that? I'll I'll, I'll take that. Okay. Uh, I didn't realize until Peter Asher um, did the induction speech that no manager had ever been elected to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And then in this case, it was the, the first two managers were Brian Epstein and Andrew Lou Goldham, who had managed the Rolling Stones, but who, in fact, had worked for Brian in the, uh, in the, in the Beatles management uh, during 1963. 
Uh, and I, I think over the year, you know, uh, opinion regarding Brian has kind of uh, evolved. Uh, you know, there was, uh, especially in the 70s and 80s, I think there were a lot of people that uh, that poo-pooed his, his ability because of the fact that uh, there, you know, there may have been some merchandising deals that he could have jumped on that he didn't. That he allowed, you know, other companies to uh, kind of uh, uh, ride on the Beatles' coattails, so to speak. Um, but I think over the years, it's it, it, it's become very evident that he was actually perfect for in the way he was able to evolve the group out of. Uh, leather and jeans and greasy hair into into suits and become more uh, more acceptable for you know for that particular time, uh, especially especially in London where you know you had to have to be a pop star you had to have a particular look, and it seemed that each at each step along the way he did pretty much exactly the right thing, especially allowing them to evolve musically. It wasn't mm. like a, you know, uh, a boy band that was told, no, 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 you're staying in your particular niche and you're just doing variations on your first couple of hits. So, in other words, after after the third record that had a harmonica in it, that was pretty much, except for a couple of uh, album tracks, here and there, that was pretty much it for the harmonica. You know, you didn't have beginning with She Loves You. It was, you know, the, if She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand and Can't Buy Me Love. Each one was a, you know, was, had a musical development going for it. Hmm. And the same with, and the same with their albums. And Brian allowed that to happen. And because he felt that it contributed that the, the musical development contributed to their mounting popularity, and, and and so he he seemed, except for as I said, some of the business aspects, he he pretty much made the right moves all along. Now whether that mm-hmm. would have continued beyond you know beyond the summer of '67, we'll never know. But uh, but certainly he absolutely deserved and, and actually was long overdue that he was given uh, given a place in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And uh, and I thought that Peter Asher's induction speech for both Brian and Andrew was, was excellent. Okay, well, absolutely. One thing about Brian that mm-hmm. I think is absolutely extraordinary, amongst many things, is that if you take uh, the time that he first became their manager to within six months, the Beatles were on BBC Radio. Mm-hmm. And they had a record contract. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's amazing. It's absolutely mm-hmm. amazing how especially, things move that quickly. Yeah, especially for a group from Liverpool, because in those days, you know, Liverpool was not looked upon as a, uh, you know, a breeding ground for pop stars other than Billy Fury. Hmm. Okay. Um, how about Ringo getting into the Hall of Fame? Tom, you wanted to take that one? Yes, um, I'll be sending out in my uh, next year's Christmas cards me wearing the T-shirt that uh, Paul's daughter wore when he was inducted. <laughs> <laughs> it's about time. Um, look, it's Plus. not like the yeah, you know, it's not like the Baseball Hall of Fame where you could say, look, there are some magic numbers here: mm-hmm. a 300 batting average, 1500 RBIs, 500 home runs. You know, these are kind of like you know. You know, that's like an automatic pass to get in. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're dealing with art at the end of the day, and commerce does play into it, but it's not clearly just about commerce, right? If it was about that, he'd have been in. Frankly, you know, he had more, you know, top tens, or at least during John's lifetime, he certainly had more number ones uh, than John, and this is not, you know, put down John night, but it's to say that it wasn't because he didn't have enough success. You know that the fact that the other three are in, yeah, their their solo careers all had ups and downs. We know that. Mm. Um, yeah, I know Ringo's glory days as a solo artist were pretty limited to a five year period, but I think what's been overlooked is what he's done for the musical tradition 
uh, you know, carrying on the multi-artist bill. He's been doing the all-star thing for over 25 years. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, you know, we start doing some of these numbers like we started the show, you know, 40 years of going to Beatle Fest and 25 years of going to all-star band concerts. Mm -hmm. um, it starts, it, the numbers start to become staggering. But many of those all-star tours, by the way, had many other Rock and Roll Hall of Famers on them. Mm -hmm. okay, from Ant Whistle to Felix to, to the guys from the band to, to now the E Street Band guys to, to, to a whole bunch of them. This is, this is something he, he knew, you know, that, you know, a sustained solo touring career probably wasn't the right thing. And he came up with, with this, you know, idea with, you know, again, with promoters and stuff who, who you know, who helped put these things together. But the fact now that he does it, you know, fairly regularly, <laughs> um, you know, this is what the 14th band or the 13th band or something that he's, that he's out with. It's three straight years with this, with this current band, which he absolutely loves. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there, th this is, this, a lot of good work has come out of that. It's not just about making new records. It's about live work. Um, it's about the influence he's had on countless drummers. You know, th there's no question he should be in there. You know, anyone that, that looks at it, I think, and says, oh, you know, anybody could have drummed in the Beatles and, or, you know, anybody could have done that. That's hogwash. Um, the fact is he did those records and the musical excellence, let's face it, um, you know, is, is kind of an intriguing footnote. I'm still not sure what that means, but it, you know, some people will be telling you, you know, he's, it's like being inducted as a Beatle twice. Well, I don't, I don't know that that's, that's entirely true. But um, the fact that he's going in is long overdue. And, you know, Paul, you know, uh, on the talk shows last week talking about that and how he might have nudged a couple of people. Ken, it just goes to show one thing. Without connections, you are dead. You go no uh, No, I, I couldn't help that. But, to, to, uh, quote, to quote our prophet, yes. Ralph Cramden. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, uh, for his work with the All Star, I've I've not missed an All Star tour. We're fortunate here in uh, the New York, New Jersey area, where every tour comes through here. Uh, I've not missed one, and I've I've never had less than a wonderful time at any of them. Um, the fact is, I probably wouldn't get up and and travel the distances that I did to go see. I don't know. You pick somebody. I don't care who you pick. Todd Rundgren or or you know Doctor John or. or Whoever, you know, but when you see all these guys all in one night, uh, and, and it's a hit fest, you know, it's, it's a great night. There's some great playing. I remember the first time, um, you know, on the 89 tour, uh, you know, I actually, you know, created a monster. I asked him at a press conference what the repertoire would be like, and he coined a phrase saying it'll be songs you know and love, which he said about five zillion times since then. Mm -hmm. But, Point of fact is, I remember going to that first show, first time I saw him in '89 in Atlantic City, and you know he comes out and he does it, "Don't Come Easy," and a couple of other songs. And I'm going, wait a minute, what's he doing playing? You know, he's playing drums on whatever Joe Walsh is playing, you know, "Life in the Fast Lane" or "Rocky Mountain Way." And I'm going, well, wait, this this isn't terrible watching Ringo Starr play drums behind Joe Walsh. Um, mm -hmm. It was kind of it, it was a great concept. Guys doing all of their uh, all of their hits. And, you know, he's not going to bring any mutts on the road. You know, some of these, these things are admittedly head scratchers when you look at them. You go, really? Rick Derringer and the guy from the Romantics? You know, <laughs> you know, you know Richard Page and Edgar Winter? That, you know, how'd that happen? Sure. Um, yet, but they, somehow, but it all makes sense. It all yeah. makes sense. they always work. Right. Yeah. I mean, he, he sure deserves to be in it more than pe some people who are in it. Yes. Right. I mean, he's going in in a class with Joan Jett. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, really? <laughs> okay. Uh, you know. Also, I mean, but you look at some, you know, some some neat acts that are in there, some of the old vocal groups, whether it be Frankie Lyman or whatever, that are in there, and you say, you know, did they have any kind of sustained career, sustained chart success, or sustained influence the way Ringo did? It's not even close. No. So I mean, to, to say, yeah, I, I mean. They're, Anyone that says this is kind of like just, you know, some sort of, you know, concession, it's, it's, it's hogwash. I mean, per Percy, when you Percy Sledge is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with one hit record. Yeah. You know, the, the criteria of, what, of how an artist goes into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is probably different for everyone who's following it. 
Should it be someone who had just a large body of work with a lot of success and commercial success? Or is influence more important? You know, um, it's, you can go back and forth on this argument. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've looked on Facebook with people arguing back and forth. But this, is, sure. this artist says it in there. And there are artists whose careers started much earlier than Ringo is as a solo artist that still haven't gotten in. Sure. You know, like, like the Moody Blues. What a crime that is. Right. I mean, and, and so much has been said about, uh, progressive rock and, and, and heavy metal artists being snubbed, which I totally agree with. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you think about it, Ringo had seven top ten singles, and there are still a few of them that get regular airplay, like it don't come easy, and still to a lesser degree, but it still gets played as, as photograph. I consider mm -hmm. those two to be classics. And he still remains to be a big influence on other drummers, whether for his work with the Beatles or for some of his solo work. And more and more you get, you get drummers, especially at the Fest for Beatles fans, mm -hmm. where you had a drummer symposium of people talking about how Ringo was an influence in some way or another as a drummer. So in so many ways, you could say Ringo definitely deserves it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Ringo definitely deserves to be there. And, and I agree that it's a, it was a mistake for him not to be there. And I think you could sit and argue over and over and over again about, you know, what the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame does. It's basically Young Winner's Baby, and he's he's controlling it. And, I mean, I even uh, somebody mentioned on Facebook the other day that it's not a real Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I or, and it's not a real Hall of Fame, and I agree. It's not. It's there's too many there's too many politics going on here. I mean, look at all the people that aren't in. I think the biggest example, the worst example of somebody that should be in that isn't in is the monkeys, and that's you know that's stupid. You know, the fact that the monkeys aren't in is really uh, a blot on the on the Rock Hall of Fame. I mean, uh, look who else isn't in the Moody Blues. I mean, why aren't the Moody Blues in there? There's absolutely no reason the Moody Blues shouldn't be in. Yes, this is somebody else. Um, you know, it's 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 absolutely ridiculous. And and this whole, you know, you got people that don't deserve to be in there. I mean, it, it's just crazy. And so, the rules are so arbitrary, and it's it's ridiculous. Well, the you know the devil's advocate would say, well, they're already in as a group, and three of them. Three of them are in as as solo artists, so, uh, so you know the thinking is well, you know, especially the people that that do say that the the category that he's in is kind of a sideline uh, category. Uh, they would say, well, you know, he had an, you know he had a number of hit records. Why isn't he in you know on his own? Yeah. Well, that's that's one of the problems because there's you know the, there are so many acts that because of all the politics and all that goes on there are so many acts that have never even been nominated the Monkey Chicago the Moody Blues Electric Light Orchestra etc. Whereas Chic gets nominated every year mm. it must have been an yeah. Alan Erdogan's will. <laughs> that, that it was stipulated that Sheik would get nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame every year. Even if they never got inducted, they would get nominated every year. They're on that ballot every year, mm. which is mind-boggling. Right. All right. Well, we have to bring the show to a close. And I just want to say, Tom, it's been, you know, a joy having you here on the show. Oh, and, uh sure. We would uh, love to have you back, and uh, I'm extending the invitation if you want to do something on the, the solo activities of 2014. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's enough here for five shows. I mean, just each topic, between five people talking about it, you know, you could do one show on each topic. Mm. So, uh, Tom, it's been great having you, and uh, okay. this, has been, this has been great. And it's been a tremendous year in a lot of ways. So... Uh, Let's hope that 2015 has a lot of excitement in store. We do know that, that Paul and Ringo will be as active as ever. And uh, Paul and Ringo both will be touring. And we know Ringo has a new solo album coming out. And sh I'm sure something will be coming out on Paul. He's been talking about that animated film, High in the Clouds, which I think 
the music might be coming out next year. That's something I would definitely be looking forward to. His but anyway. Art, and he's got his next archive releases, including the very best solo album made by any of them. <laughs> that we're having you on for that show too. Talking about, you, know, you like how I worm my way in there, huh? Yes, you do. Very clever of you. He's yeah. talking about the Tug of War album, in case any of you are guessing. But he wrote a really nice article, which I read online, about why why Tom feels that's Paul's best solo album. But now you're saying the best solo album, period. You bet. Okay. Yeah. Well. Ooh. Okay. Um. That'll that'll be a nice debate. <laughs> Yeah, everyone knows it's life with the lions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this has been great. And uh, for things we said today, I'm Ken Michaels. And for Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, Al Sussman, and our special guest, Tom Franjone, 